In the year of 70 CE, after four years of control by rebel leaders of the first Jewish revolt, the city of Jerusalem found itself facing down the legions of the Roman Empire. The story of the Siege of Jerusalem is a story of how resilient a rebellion can be, even in the face of overwhelming odds. But there are other lessons to be learned from the siege as well. Let's find those lessons together. Sit back, relax, and let me tell you a story while Rome burns. Our story begins in 63 BCE. The Roman general Pompey the Great conquered Jerusalem and the surrounding lands. The province of Judea was created, but rule was given over to a line of local client kings that were allowed to run the day-to-day -day administration of the province with the tacit endorsement of the Roman Senate and later the Roman emperors. Throughout the ensuing decades, however, Rome tightened its grip and eventually control passed to the Roman procurators, who typically lacked the will of the people to rule and were thus highly unpopular. As the stirrings of rebellion began, the key issues were religion and taxation. These issues would eventually lead to war with the legions. The Romans believed in a concept known as Pax Deorum, the peace of the gods. The peace of the gods, it was believed, allowed the Roman Empire to grow, conquer, and expand from its humble beginnings into the world-spanning empire that they had come to know. The Pax Deorum was obtained through piety and correct religious observation. Roman pagan religious practices were full of pomp and ceremony. Every act in a ritual or prayer was highly choreographed and practiced in order to maintain the happiness and favor of whichever god, goddess, or deity was being invoked in that moment. Impiety, or straying from proper religious expression, brought about the Ira Deorum, the anger of the gods. But this belief in Pax Deorum was not an individual requirement of proper religious expression. It was communal. The community as a whole needed to engage in the rituals and customs of Roman paganism in order to maintain the god's favor. For obvious reasons, the Jewish people who practiced their religion worshipped only one god, and to engage in acts contrary to that religious view was not tolerated. This was one of the main boiling points that brought the zealots' legitimacy over the years. The Great Revolt, as it would later be known by historians, began in the year 66 CE. According to the historian Josephus, the Jerusalem riots of 66 CE were sparked by a few Greeks who had performed a pagan sacrifice outside of a synagogue. The clashes were violent and made worse by the inaction of the local Roman garrison. As the tensions between the Jewish and Hellenistic religious traditions boiled over, the Great Revolt was underway. Religious leaders in the city ceased sacrifice and prayer for the Roman Emperor. As the population broke out into protests and riots, attacks began taking place on Roman citizens or perceived traitors to the Jewish people. The Roman governor, Gessius Florus, did nothing to ease these tensions and instead ordered 17 talents taken from the treasury of the temple. Florus was quick to punish the protesters. He ordered Roman soldiers into the city to arrest the leaders. These leaders, many of whom were Roman citizens, were beaten, whipped, and crucified. This did nothing to calm the tensions and only served to inflame the righteous fury that the people of Jerusalem had. Taking up arms against their Roman overlords, the rebels, led by the zealots, attacked the Roman garrison of soldiers in the city. 
eventually capturing and forcing the surrender of the soldiers there. The soldiers were shown no mercy. According to Josephus, they were executed with extreme prejudice. Over the next four years, the Zealots saw victories and defeats across the province of Judea and found themselves fighting with other factions that were trying to lead the revolt of the Jewish people. A provisional government of Judea was formed by the more moderate leaders, but after a false report that they had reached an accord with the Romans, the leaders of this provisional government were killed by the Zealots. The city of Jerusalem was now in the hands of the Zealots, who were ready to fight to the death of every man, woman, and child rather than give in to the Roman powers. The war culminated in a final battle when the Roman general Titus Flavius began a siege of Jerusalem on April 14th of 70 CE. The siege began just a few days before the Passover holiday, meaning that the rebel-held city also had thousands of migrants who had come to the holy city to celebrate. Titus ordered three legions to surround Jerusalem, with a fourth legion being camped on the Mount of Olives to the east. He knew how well defended the city would be, and prepared his men for a long, drawn-out battle. The city was made up of five regions. The upper city, the lower city, the temple mount, the second city, and the new city. High walls and stout battlements protected these regions and encircled the city, making it one of the most fortified cities of the ancient world. It would take everything in Titus's playbook to be able to breach the walls and put an end to the rebellion. One benefit to Titus and his legions was the fractious political situation that had occurred within the Jewish rebels during the four years of the revolt. A centralized government had failed to come together, and as a result, several factions now held power over different sections of the city. The Zealots controlled the lower city and the Temple Mount, while more moderate factions controlled the upper city. The infighting among the various factions led to the burning or destruction of food stores, leading to a huge shortage of supplies meant to feed the people of the city. With an even larger population than was normal for the city, and food stores being destroyed, the attrition that comes with a siege was accelerated. As the siege began, small skirmishes between the Jewish defenders and the Roman legionaries took place outside the city walls. Eventually, the battering rams breached the third wall surrounding the new city, and rebels fled behind the safety of the second wall, yielding ground to the Roman legions. Titus ordered a new camp established in the heart of the new city, and ordered that many of the buildings be torn down. This occurred within the first month of the siege, and the long, drawn-out affair that Titus had planned for seemed to be a distant memory. Within a few days of establishing their camp inside the new city, the second wall was breached, and Titus pressed forward. As the legion advanced through the breach, they found the streets seemingly deserted by the rebels. After advancing further into the city, the rebels sprung a surprise trap and unleashed a volley of arrows and stones on the clustered forces. The Romans were shocked by the trap, and many legionaries met their doom in the streets of Jerusalem that day. The legion attempted to retreat through the breach, but the size of the breach was too small and only a few men at a time could pass through. This led to the deaths of many more Romans. The Jewish forces then surged out after the Romans and engaged in battle while the breach was repaired. The fighting lasted all day and most of the night. Once repaired, the rebel forces retreated back behind the safety of the walls. 
No doubt annoyed, but possibly impressed by the tactics of the Jewish rebels, Titus ordered the entire northern section of the wall demolished so as to prevent any similar disasters from occurring again. The rebel forces retreated back to the first wall and prepared for a final stand against the Romans. The first wall was the last defense for the Jewish people, but it was also their most fortified position. The Jewish forces were better able to consolidate their defensive positions and concentrate their attacks more effectively from this position. The rebel forces were able to bring a massive volley of missile attacks upon the Roman soldiers, driving them back and forcing them to take protective measures of their own. Titus ordered siege equipment brought up and for ramps to be constructed leading up to the Antonia Fortress. The rebels, seeing the possibility of being flanked should the Antonia Fortress be lost, began tunneling underneath the fortress to the siege ramps themselves. Lighting the wooden supports for the tunnels on fire, the ramps collapsed destroying the siege towers and taking Roman lives. The fortress remained protected, and the siege was set to continue on. That same night, rebel forces poured out of the first wall and attacked the siege equipment in the new city, setting the equipment on fire and driving the Romans back. At this point, nearly all their siege weapons had been destroyed, and their forces were driven back to the camp that was set up in the new city. Titus, in an attempt to rally his forces, rode out personally to lead a cavalry attack on the rebels, who retreated behind the first wall once more. The Roman morale was low, and Titus needed something to both lift their spirits and place the momentum of victory back on his side. Titus ordered all four of his legions to begin construction of a wall that would encircle the rebel-held parts of the city, as well as cut off any chance of escape for the rebels once the siege was broken. The wall was over eight kilometers long, with several forts constructed as well. In order to boost the morale, Titus challenged the legionaries to a contest to see which group could complete their assigned section of the wall. This friendly competition helped restore the unit cohesion, camaraderie, and morale of the legions. The entire structure was completed within three days, as the legionaries had built the wall well outside the line of attack from the rebels. With the wall complete, the rebels, who had been able to slip out under the cover of darkness and collect supplies from the countryside, were easily discovered and ended up crucified as an example of what the Romans had in store. Defectors were given similar treatment as well. Titus was beyond showing any mercy at this point. Within a few weeks, the tunnel that had proved the salvation of the Antonia Fortress proved to be its undoing. A heavy rain came through that caused the ground beneath the northern wall of the Antonia to collapse. Romans eventually flooded in and razed the Antonia to the ground, forcing the Jewish defenders to fall back to the Temple Mount. Titus knew where to concentrate his efforts now and was preparing for a grand assault on the temple. After several bloody, demoralizing false starts, Titus ordered his army to tear down the entire northern wall of the Temple Mount, allowing his remaining forces to mobilize along the entire length of the Temple Plaza. This left the Jewish defenders dangerously exposed as they retreated into the safety of the Temple. Sadly, the Temple's inner courts would prove to be no match for the swarm of Roman soldiers that were soon bearing down upon the rebels. A fire was started by the Romans that quickly spread through the temple, destroying the sacred grounds of the Jewish people and destroying the Jewish rebels' strongest position. The rebels retreated and the legionaries devolved into looting and pillaging the treasures of the temple. 
the orders of Titus and his officers were said to have little effect on quelling the passions of the soldiers. In a final act of sacrilege, and to demonstrate the victory of the Roman gods over the Jewish god Yahweh, Titus ordered an ox, pig, and sheep to be sacrificed on the temple grounds. After negotiations between Titus and rebel leaders fell apart, the Romans engaged in a wholesale slaughter of both rebels and non-combatants in the lower city. Hundreds of thousands lost their lives, whether or not they supported the rebellion. The final push of the siege took place in the early weeks of September, with the palace of Herod crumbling under the pressure of Roman power. At the end of the siege, the rebel leaders were taken prisoner and forced to march in the triumph of Titus when he arrived back in Rome. Women and children in Jerusalem that had not been killed were sold into slavery, while men over the age of 17 were either killed or sent to work in the mines of Egypt or forced to fight in gladiatorial combat. The siege of Jerusalem was completed, and the holy city of the Jewish people was reduced to rubble. The siege served not only as an object lesson to other provinces under Roman control, but also helped to shore up the legitimacy of the newly founded Flavian dynasty. But the lasting effects of the siege of Jerusalem can still be felt today. The Temple Mount has been a site of so much religious interest by the three Abrahamic religions and has led to so much violence, death, and carnage that it still impacts us well into the 21st century. The siege of Jerusalem impacted Judaism significantly and moved it from a temple religion of sacrifice and observance of certain ceremonies to one of teaching, community, and service to others. The destruction of the temple also served to separate the Christians, who at the time were seen as a sect of Judaism, into their own religion. The Temple Mount would eventually have a Muslim shrine, the Dome of the Rock, built upon it, leading to further tension in the region for centuries and centuries to come, seemingly without end. But the real cost of the siege is in the countless lives lost in a bloody battle. Many of those lives were refugees forced to flee to Jerusalem, or otherwise pilgrims seeking to observe their religion in their holy city. So many stories ended during those fateful four months in Jerusalem, and those stories are now nothing more than a footnote in history. The devastation that occurred at Jerusalem serves as a warning for future civilizations that we must strive toward peace, inclusion, and religious pluralism as a species. Otherwise, we are doomed to revisit this devastation upon future generations indefinitely. Thank you for listening to our show. While Rome Burns is part of the One Up Podcast Network. Find more of our content by going to oneuppodcasts.com. Cover art by Igor Nunez. You can contact him for commissions on Twitter at WeCan. That's W-H-Y-C-C-A-N. Find more of his work by going to wecan.artstation.com. Background music provided by One Place Here under a Creative Commons Zero 1.0 Universal Public Domain Dedication. Find them on Twitter at one place your music or at freemusicarchive.org slash music slash one place here. Additional background music provided by tabletopaudio.com under an attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license from Creative Commons. Find more ambient music, sound effects, and more by going to tabletopaudio.com. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode of the show. Bye.